the Brahma Kumaris in America invite you to celebrate Mother India's 75th year of independence as we take time to feel the soul of India. Throughout time, India and America have had strong relations built on mutual respect and contributions to its progress and development. We'd like to take you on a journey. As we descend on earth and begin to play out our parts, we marvel at the incredible mysticism of India, the diversity of religions, the colors, the joyfulness, the prayers, the love and reverence for God. And as we ventured abroad to find new opportunities, we excelled and became doctors, entrepreneurs, and scientists. We made an impact in politics, business, fashion, the arts, and more. We brought our family values, value for education, generosity, hard work, and our hearts to America. We entertain, and most importantly, we uplift lives. Ours is a learning and growing relationship. And now, together we celebrate 75 years of India's independence. When we look inside ourselves, we ask, who am I? Who do I belong to? Where am I from? And we begin by seeing ourselves as souls, first connected to the Supreme, belonging to the One, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, truly the world as one family. One of our greatest contributions have been music and dance. Did you know that many dances are a sacred expression of a story in the scriptures? Dance has brought us to a deeper place in ourselves. Kathak, Bharatnatyam, Odyssey, these dances continue to remind us of the sacredness within. Our spirituality is deep. The studies, stories, scriptures, the celebration of knowing that the deepest part of the soul, the energy that we are, that inner light is our spiritual potential. And we brought it here to enhance America's glory. It has been embraced and loved by all walks of life. Over 38 million people practice yoga. We love that Diwali is a favorite holiday in America now. Our roots, our values, they are intrinsic, just as yours. And we are proud to be a part of the fiber of the United States and to call this home. Let this be our pride as we celebrate the world's largest democracy, India's 75 years of love, values, soul, life. Good evening and welcome back to Global Harmony House. Congratulations for coming. We appreciate everybody in attendance. We think it's wonderful that we are back and that you are back. And um, I hope you have survived well without sitting in this room because we've missed you. And we're slowly going to uh, open up some things. And I noticed on the bus coming here this week that it no longer says masks required, it says masks recommended, optional, something like that. Um, and we would recommend masks here also. We hope you stay healthy. We hope this is a wonderful program full of vim and vigor and all sorts of things. But um, the best we can do at this time is to say, stay well, stay healthy, 
stay happy, keep smiling. And I know if you have your mask on, you are smiling. I just know these things. This is wonderful. And so tonight is the first time we've had a, what we call our Thursday night public program. Um, we've been doing that on Zoom for years now, and it's continuing. It's a hybrid tonight. We're on Zoom and we're in person, and you are the persons who are here. So congratulations once again. I have been uh, asked to uh, share and move along some of the conversations, but first I would like to thank Ram, who played the music and was the performer, and um, he gave us a bio, but it's all about his legal career. And so um, he doesn't moonlight as a musician, he actually daylights as a lawyer, something like that. So Ram, thank you so much. And I believe that at the end for the meditation, you will join us again. So thank you very much, Ram, through those who were able to hear. And if I've got my program right, I am here to um, kind of start it off. Um, you saw the little video, and we are here to celebrate the soul of India and looking to have um, some presentations and some conversations about what that might mean and what we've taken here in the United States that might be uh, fundamentally spiritually bound and that we might be able to take benefit from. We're going to have some conversations to take us to that, but we thought we would also be very patriotic. And so we have uh, invited two presenters. And I would like to invite first up, I believe it's going to be um, Nidhi Guru. And she is going to share with us the Indian National Anthem. And Nidhi is also um, a Chief Events Coordinator for the International Center of Cultural Integration. And, and additionally, she's a founder of the South Asian Women Empowerment Forum. And so she's going to share with us the Indian National Anthem. And when she is done, she's gonna pass the microphone to Michelle Delafar. I hope that's right. And Michelle has been well-traveled, uh, helping with um, some of the programs, but she started out with the, um, almost, yeah, there we go. Pretty, we're all excited to get things going here. And so almost, and so, um, Michelle is the one who started singing with Dean Martin and has been traveling around and actually has a couple CDs and is still performing and has performed on tonight's show, uh, Mike Douglas show, uh, Dean Martin and a number of other things. So great talent tonight. And I'm gonna pass this microphone to Nidhi who is going to share with us the Indian national anthem and then we'll have the US if that's okay. All right. And who's we? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It is an honor to be here. I will be starting with the Indian National Anthem. I would request for us all to stand for that piece. And whoever can sing along, please sing along. I will have Miss Gunjan Rastogi and Raj Dhingra sing with us and um, our dear singer, Michelle, are you coming? Okay. Because I, I thought you were going to join us. If you, if you can, that's okay. All right. Okay. So please sing. Whoever knows the lyrics, please join us. We'll start. Yeah, and take the whole show. जन गन मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध उच्चल चल दीत रंगा तब शुभुना में जागे तब शुभुना शिष्य मागे गाओ इन सब जने गाथा 
जय हिंद जय हिंद भारत माता की जय भारत माता की जय stand for the national anthem of United States of America. I'm blessed to be here. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Sport stripes and bright stars through all the perilous fight. For the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets were clear, the bombs Patriotism hasn't sounded so lovely in a long time. So thank you, America. Thank you, India. Thank all of you from wherever you are. It's been wonderful. So uh, continuing with the reasons we are having the Soul of India programs, we thought it would be appropriate that as an organization that is based in India, the Brahma Kumari Parakya University, um, it is also the nation of India's 75th anniversary. So our feeling is that we wanted to explore some of the values, the qualities, the inheritance that we've received from that land that we might be using here. And to help us with that um, is going to be uh, Sister Mohini, as I know her. Some are calling her Mohini Didi because of her elevated state and recent position, and some are calling her their friend, and I hope that you will be able to call her your friend also, because Sister Mohini is um, now the additional administrative head of the organization worldwide. She's based here, but unlike you, she is not going to be here in person, so she's going to give a message that we are going to see and hear, I believe, when I step off this stage. And so I invite Sister Mohini to join us. That's me. And uh, <laughs> I'm not Sister Mohini, if you didn't know. But she is going to share a message with us and uh, guide us into the soul of India. Today, we are celebrating our 75th Amrit Mausa for independence of India, Bharat. Bharat is a ancient land and at that ancient time there were deities 
who used to rule. Every human being was very divine, was very pure. And that was called the golden times, golden age of Bharat. We all lived there. And then gradually, gradually, degrees start declining. Bharat is the country which is very known for giving the gift of spirituality to all over the world, to everyone. Truth was our always main value or motto. It is said, victory in the truth. Our history also tells us that not truth just says truth, but eternal truth, which was again spoken, written in Vedas, Upanishads, and many other scriptures. And actually, many, many from the world still try to understand that truth from Vedas. Even for medical, we have something for Ayurveda and it's created, made from many different herbs and how they found it in different mountains, they will bring it and make it herbal medicine. It's so popular all over the world because most of other medicines have some side effects, but Ayurveda is something with the work with the elements and also they look at within your body, how the five elements work. Some have more earth, some have more fire, some have more water. So they explored the nature. And also there is respect for the family. There is respect for the nature that they call mother nature. Even for country, there is so much love that they call it mother country. This is the country at present with the largest population, but with a democratic system where everyone has equal right. All basic rights are provided in our constitution. Respect for parents, love for all elders and also respect for all the spiritual leaders. So it's a great land where I found that even those who are in high positions or politicians and they are very, very scholarly, very learned. Today I was listening to a talk by central minister and she was so good in giving the examples from Gita and many scriptures. So I think that Bharat is the land which is spiritual guru for the world. But most important is socially also. I think out of 365 days, maybe 300 days, we celebrate something. We respect our ancestors. So these days we are offering food, respects, prayers to our ancestor souls. And then we will have 
goddess says worshiping we will have a burning of ravan every day you celebrate something this way we are able to be together not only it is done more as a devotion but also some spiritual significance is there instead of going to different places for entertainment i think our lives are lives of celebration in bharat whenever i visit india i love to be there with their colorful dresses and so many beautiful things and especially celebration of diwali and all the temples are full with the devotees and everyone do lot of lot of buying shopping so our principle the moral value in bharat is to stay together as family and consider everyone as the member of your family so love and respect and definitely not to say much but non violence mahatma gandhi's principle also is very well recognized and adopted all over the world so i am very proud that we are celebrating our amrit mahotsav even in new york so my love and good wishes to everyone om shanti so we received a message from sister mohini from the brahma kumaris about the soul of india and the 75th anniversary of the founding of that country and we also have a message from our next presenter who actually i'm very glad is here and that would be our council general randeer jaiswal and as the screen goes up and the lights come on i can see because i could make it up but it's probably better to be factual at this moment and so um council general is a career diplomat and he joined the indian foreign service in 1998 and he has served over two decades in his diplomatic career and the countries if they have included them all include portugal cuba south africa and the permanent mission of india in new york which is his current position and we're very happy to have him here because he has also served in new delhi in the minister of external affairs first as the deputy secretary looking after india's relationship with the united states of america big job good luck and then joint secretary managing india's relationship with western europe countries and so he is with us tonight um and my understanding of politicians is they kind of double book themselves and they're very busy and so we're very pleased to have him here for the short time that he said he would be here although you are quite welcome to spend the entire evening with us because these wise people have chosen to do so and their intellect might be guiding you but that's just my suggestion so um if you would be so kind i would like to give you this microphone so that you might be able to share your message for the soul of india consul general namaste and good evening dear friends a very warm thank you to you for a very humorous welcome it always makes life very easy and comfortable thank you to our dear friends from brahma kumaris for celebrating soul of india as a respect and tribute to india at 75 our independence our democracy our freedom we've had a series of celebrations 
here in New York and across the world on various aspects of India, art, literature, innovation, startup, women, space. But I'm truly delighted that we also have not forgotten and in fact focusing to highlight as to how we can together celebrate India's spirituality or tradition of spirituality and thought as part of our India at 75 celebrations. Some time back we had, all of you know that India is remembered for many things, among them land of sages and seers, for it is land of spirituality. So some time back we had a celebration with Sri Chinmaya Mission here, remembering his contribution to the spiritual world. And a week back, we again had a spiritual celebration at the consulate. And we are now here celebrating as to how India has contributed or Brahma Kumaris and similar organizations across the world are celebrating or contributing to the spiritual world. The material world gives you comfort, appeals to your senses, but the spiritual world is important because you have to appeal to your soul as much. So thank you very much for celebrating Soul of India. Life is, you know, very nutshell, if you put, draw a line, it is positive and negative. Everything will fall in that category, positive side and negative side. So therefore, life is about balance. In yoga, you do one exercise on the left-hand side and then you do the other on the right-hand side because you have to achieve that balance. And for that reason, in our lives and in a material life, it's important that we balance it out with some spirituality. Material life is good, comfortable, but it cannot be everything. If you miss out on the spiritual aspect of it, Material life becomes immaterial, it doesn't appeal. It leads to all sorts of situations. Take the example of climate change, for example. We all want to now move on the path of low carbon. We all want to do things in a manner that the nature is comfortable with. Whenever there's imbalance, there are problems. COVID, it, one particular aspect of looking at COVID is the balance was lost. It could be the case with, with the other pandemics that we've had in the past as well. So therefore, to achieve this balance and equilibrium in life, it's important that we celebrate spirituality. We introspect. We look at all that is required from a larger perspective of our existence. And therefore, this celebration today is very meaningful and very deep. Thank you very much. Of Brahma Kumaris, let me say, I've traveled the world and wherever I go, they remind me of the beautiful tradition of Raksha Bandhan that we have in India. Every 15th August, I used to be tied with a Rakhi in Johannesburg in South Africa. Our sisters from Brahma Kumaris would be there early morning before the flag hoisting to tie the Rakhi. It's a beautiful tradition. Thank you very much. Let us continue on the good path, on the beautiful culture that you have put in place, globally speaking. And we are there, I'm there to support it. Thank you very much once again, and a happy evening to all of you. Thank you very much. So are you inspired and ready and willing to take some more good news and good words that have already been said, then I would like to almost kind of pass the baton, microphone actually, um, to our next presenter who's going to host the panel. And um, she might even get some water while she's talking. Hope everybody else on stage will get that too. I'm not sure how that's gonna work out, but I'd like to invite um, Judy Rogers uh, to join us on stage. She is um, got lots of bullet points after her name, but one is the founder of um, Images and Voices of uh, Hope. And um, I would like to say one of the more important things is she's a friend of mine. 
and she is also one of the best facilitators on the planet. She listens well, she understands what people are saying, and she is in high demand around the world to be able to sort things out and find out what the threads are. And so some of the threads are going to be presented tonight by some of the individuals she's going to introduce and invite up now. And so if it's okay, my friend, Judy, hey, would you Judy. please take over? Yeah. There's a uh, microphone there and there's a microphone. There. All right. So thanks so much. Thank you, Council General. Thank you to our singers. That was brilliant. Really brilliant. That American anthem is unsingable by anyone but you. I mean, just saying, all the way through school, we squeaked along trying to sing that song. So, yeah. So let me invite up um, John Kamen, Charlie Hawk, and Champak. Come on up. And uh, Champak, why don't you sit in the middle since you are the odd one out? <laughs> men on the end. Does everyone in this room know the Brahma Kumaris? No one, can, no one arrived here not knowing who the Brahma Kumaris are, right? Just checking. Your friend didn't bring you and you're not sure why you're here. Okay, good. So, um, as you now are well aware, we're here to celebrate the world's largest democracy, 75th birthday year, which is a big, it's a big deal, right? India is such an old and rich culture and so diverse that it is impossible to summarize in a few words. And it's home to many of the world's oldest religions, Dharma paths, and many who are searching for truth and meaning in life, find that their paths take them either to India or through India, like the Beatles, right? That's when a lot of us first became aware of what that about India. Um, famous for nonviolence, for Gandhi. But tonight, we're going to reflect on the gifts of India to the world through the eyes of these three people, born on different continents, in different generations, belonging to different religions and working on different fields of action. What they share is a deep interest in living lives with meaning and into the principles that make for a worthwhile life. So I want to introduce them. Farthest away from me is John Kamen, the Deputy County Executive of Suffolk County. He has a 24 year political career that includes stints as the North Hempstead Town Supervisor, Nassau County District Court Judge, New York State Advisor for Superstorm Sandy Recovery. And for 10 years, he was the Master of Ceremony for the Long Island Alliance for Peaceful Alternatives, the Hiroshima commemoration to ban nuclear weapons. And I'm bringing that up because later I'm going to talk with you about that a little bit about peace. As a town supervisor, he introduced the Asian American Festival to North Hempstead in 2010 to celebrate the diversity in the community. So welcome, John. Next to him, we have Champak Zaslavsky. Did I say your name right? Oh, All right. Thank You're you. the first one. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow, that's quite an honor. So you wouldn't guess it, but Chumpak is a business consultant specializing in organizational culture, behavior, and teamwork. She was born in Brooklyn in 1996 to a Jewish father and a Muslim mother, both from the USSR. And though they had come to the US to seek a better life, they returned to Moscow when she was two. When Chumpak was 11, her parents, and especially her mother, joined the Hare Krishna movement, and Chumpak eagerly followed, committed to principles of nonviolence, sober consciousness, and humility, 
She believes spiritual practice makes people more mindful, compassionate, empathetic, and emotionally intelligent. She hopes to communicate this to leaders through her work. Welcome, Champa. And then sitting closest to me is Charlie Hogg. Charlie is a spiritual leader with 47 years of meditation experience, who is the national coordinator of the Brahma Kumaris activities in Australia. So if you go to Australia, they will tie your Rocky. <laughs> and they'll make sure that happens. Charlie's relationship with India started from a very young age. His father's business was in textiles in Australia. And so his father made frequent visits to India but Charlie's spiritual journey began in the 1960s. He was an idealist whose purpose was world peace. Now you begin to see the strands among these three, right? As a student of the Brahma Kumaris, he has visited India around 90 times. Yeah, I know. He is a much sought after meditation teacher, speaker and retreat leader, and his journey has taken him to 80 countries. He has a special gift for applying his spiritual wisdom to understanding matters of the heart. So welcome, Charlie. Okay, now I wanna dig in a little bit and I wanna start with John. So John, in your search for meaning, you came across this famous essay by Henry David Thoreau, Civil Disobedience, right? Which is an argument, makes an argument for disobedience in an unjust state. At what point in your life did you discover civil disobedience and what in that essay spoke to you? So I, I went to a camp called Camp Thoreau for Henry David Thoreau very young child and spent many, many years uh, in a camp where we literally learned about civil disobedience as part of our everyday culture in camps. We played softball, wet and swimming in the lake and, and sat down and discussed Emerson and Thoreau and, wow, and what was wrong with the world. I, I would say we actually, in one hot August night, we were asked to stay up and listen to President Nixon resign, which was resigned in August in, in the 70s. So this was a very political... Wow. Yeah. yeah, where they, they taught us that we had a responsibility and, and Thoreau, uh, and Emerson to some, extent, to some extent, but mostly Thoreau, was really a guide for us to, to understand that we have a responsibility. And it's not just about the fun and games of life, but also that uh, we are uh, responsible for, for each other and for who we are and what we do and how we connect with the world. Um, and so that, that experience led me to, to uh, a very political outlook. And so as I grew and became engaged in, in older years and went to law school and, and followed politics and always understood that I had a responsibility and part of it was understanding that this, this concept of civil disobedience and to try to understand um, what it actually meant. Right? We're a nation of laws in this country. We believe we should follow the law. But what happens if you disagree with the law? What happens if you disagree with what the country is doing? Can you just not abide by the laws? Can you not pay your taxes? Can you not uh, follow the directions of the authorities? Can you, can you just go your own path? We have liberty here, the, the freedom to do right. what we want to do, but there's limitation. It's called ordered liberty, which is actually the subject of the Supreme Court's decisions recently. And so the, the, Roe, the, 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 the Thoreau's concept of civil disobedience, which by the way, I understand Mahatma Gandhi, right, when he was in jail right. in, in South Africa um, and led him to, to write and, and, and pursue civil disobedience, nonviolent disagreement with your government. Uh, the idea that, that we, are, we can claim the good things in our lives, but we have responsibility to point out the bad. We can't attack our country. We can't separate from our country, but we can, we can disagree in a way, making a statement, that, that puts us in jeopardy. Thoreau went to jail, maybe for a day, maybe for a matter of hours, but we can, we can make that statement. That statement is important for other people to see. And so the connection to me and my, my political path was that 
I believe in the system. I believe in our government. I believe in our country. I believe in the ideas, the founding principles of liberty and 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 the aspirational goals mm. in our in all our documents are constitutional. So your parents yeah. must have also led the way. I mean, who sends their kid to Thoreau camp? I mean, uh, somebody's special, no? Yeah, I suppose uh, they, there's. It was a uh, it was three liberal camps in New York at the time, and, and Kinderhook was one, and Thoreau was another. Um, but it was a family, you know. It was a, it was a perception that we had that this was. It was more to just life than fun and game. So right. I guess just the, the, the ultimately the, the path that led me to civil disobedience and understanding the room was simply to pursue decisions that I made in a way that gave me a way to participate in the system while I can disagree with it and, and make that statement in a, in a compelling way without undermining Mm. The, the country that I support and make the country. Isn't it refreshing to have someone in politics who comes from such a deeply philosophical place? I mean, that's really a matter, isn't it? It, it doesn't always work. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to whether it works or not. But the, the coming from principle, right? Which is, which is, gosh, we're aching for that. Thank you, John. Champak, you actually weren't searching, right? If I understand your story, your mom joined the Hare Krishna movement when you were about 11. So you were found by the principles of the East. Is that right? So what in the Hare Krishna or the ISKCON principles or what about Vedic philosophy are you drawn to? Well, I think as children, we are, we're so inquisitive. We have a million questions and we start asking them at a very early age. And I think a lot of the times when it comes to, you know, mommy, what is my life about? <laughs> what, what is the meaning of all of this? Um, why do we exist? And more existential philosophical questions, um, parents that haven't given that much thought are feeling challenged by, by those questions from their child. And, you know, maybe they give them an answer like, that's not very important, sweetie, you know, or- <laughs> don't, or uh, don't ask that kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> focus on your homework. Um, but, but maybe they, you know, say something uh, generic that they may, may have heard from, maybe religion they grew up in or or something that um, um maybe they tell themselves as you know maybe right. but that's, that that's my higher purpose but that wasn't your household your, no right. <laughs> so was, your mom said yes yeah, so my mom was a um, my mom was a true seeker she's tried a lot of things um and she found this um movement a tradition out of a lot of suffering and pain and um, and and when she did, she uh, it completely transformed her life. Is so, that what drew you? You saw her change. Is that it? What 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 that, pulled you at eleven? What made you say yes to that? And yeah, I guess um, first just seeing how that transformed her, mm -hmm. and I think just being given um, quest uh, answers to some of the questions that I had. So, what answer did you like? Um, I liked, um, I liked the answer that, um, you know, we, we are all children of God and we're not, we're a spirit soul and, and our true nature is to, um, is to serve God and to love God, not in a common way that we use the word love, but right. A higher love, um, which means service, and I guess the goal made sense to me because everything else um, is temporary, apart from right. that connection to something that is always with me. Um, so you felt that when she said, "You're a soul, spirit, spirit, soul." I don't remember exactly how <laughs> all of that. You know, I was only eleven, um, right? But but all of this kind of came natural. So I don't remember you know, a lot of those conversations, um, but I, I do remember the feeling of, 
um, um, just just that I I'm so safe with feeling That's that I the word I was thinking too. So. Yeah, safe with feeling that I know what my life is going to be about, and I feel so happy understanding that. And and there are very you know concrete things that uh, because you know we say love of God, but what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. So there were very concrete things that made a lot of sense to me, like the um, four principles that um, we have in our philosophy of um, compassion and truthfulness and um, purity and asceticism, um, which maybe they sound a bit dry, but if you, if, if you start thinking about what, what it actually means, um, like asceticism, for example, just means um, controlling your senses. And at first it's not very attractive maybe <laughs> to, to think about that. Um, but actually why, what happens when we control our senses is we, we actually become much more sensitive to, to everything around us, to love, to mm -hmm. um, you know, more subtle energies that, that we're able to feel. Right. And we, when we, you know, on the other hand, overindulge in just whatever. gratifying our right. senses, whatever mm -hmm. we want to do, our heart becomes hard. Mm -hmm. And we're not actually able to feel um, love or happiness anymore. And uh, life becomes That's just beautiful. empty. And Doesn't this give you hope when you hear someone the age that Chumpak is speaking about these things? That's beautiful. Thank you, Chumpak. That's beautiful. So Charlie, you began seeking when you were barely 20. Can you share that story of your seeking? Where did you go and what were you looking for and what did you eventually find? Um, Is that on? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Julian. It's lovely to be with John and Shantak also. Um, I think I was quite a searcher from a, a young age, like many in this room. My nickname at school, because um, I was into talking about philosophy and things, my friends called me Swami. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think you can understand what sort of person I was like. But actually, I went to university, I was studying architecture, but I, you know, when you see the state of the world, a bit like what you were describing, and um, I just felt driven to search more deeply, and I took a one-way ticket, and I wandered across the world for a couple of just, years. I'm concerned about the, uh, do you want us to turn that other mic off, that second mic, you in the sound booth? Can you just turn that mic off? Thank you. It's not really going off. Okay, I'll leave it to you. Go ahead, Charlie. I just don't want that to distract them from your story. Go ahead. But in that trip, I spent maybe close to a year in India. And you know <clears throat> how life is. I didn't make a conscious decision, but I always ended up in religious communities. So I dipped my toes in the Ganges. That was about as far as I got. <laughs> I live with a yogi in the Himalayas. I spend quite a bit of time with the Dalai Lama. I spend time at the Golden Temple, etc. And I think as soon as I visited India, I felt incredibly comfortable. And when I was just watching the opening, it said the soul of India. And really I was thinking the soul of India really touched my soul and completely changed my life. But I wandered on to London. I was working in London. I think um, I used to think that London in those days was like a spiritual supermarket. Everything was available. And I was sort of shopping around. But I came across the Brahma Kumaris. And as I was traveling, I think I loved all the philosophy because I live with Muslims and Christians and Buddhists and Sikhs and Taoists and all sorts of people. But I was really interested how you convert theory, philosophy, belief into a tangible internal experience. And when I was in London, I came across the Brahma Kumaris as I was moving around. And 
just by looking at their faces and their feelings, I, you know how you can read people by their face and the feelings. I knew that they had an inner experience and this really touched me deeply. And I think they offered me a few truths that I was able to experience. And um, <clears throat> in a sense, I feel these truths are embedded in the soul of India. And just as you were saying, Champak, that, um, that who am I, that I am an eternal soul. Actually, we all believe that. But they sort of educated me how to transform, unpack that truth so that I could feel it and taste a quality of peace that I hadn't really tasted before. And also the relationship with the divine. You know, to be very frank with you, growing up in Australia, you know, I went to church and so on, but I, I found it hard to relate to the God that they were teaching me about. And I have greatest respect for that religion. But my perception, I was 12, my perception was that this God was a very authoritarian, judgmental, sort of punishing God, and that wasn't comfortable. But, um, and so when I really was able to be connected to a loving God, I really tasted a quality of love that I feel really changed me as a person. And so I think that um, probably one other truth was really profound in my life. As a young person, I felt really disturbed by the state of the world. I think, you know, when you're at the, the camps and things that John was talking about, and I, you know, you, you, you just can't understand logically why people can be so cruel to each other and so disrespectful. And when I understood that not only am I a soul, but every other being on this planet is a soul. We are a family. And then what I learned from the Brahma Kumaras, if you see the body, you will always see difference. But when you tune into the reality of the other as a spiritual being. We are one family beyond gender, beyond nationality, beyond re religion, all the differences, and it's a real state of being. And I think that really taught me deeply how to be more respectful to those who are different from me. And, um, and I think it's absolutely in the soul of India, this sort of thinking yeah. and experience. So this searching, right? A lot of you recognize these this 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 desire to find meaning. So, um, all right. So, I want to talk about what happens when we apply these higher principles in the real world. You know, when the where the rubber meets the road, as they say. And if you'd pass the mic to John. So, John, you have chosen to work in the political arena. And I believe at times you have felt you needed to take a stand. Um, in fact, I think you said, I believe that the American government is a practical application of enlightened political philosophy, right? But how do we make the social contract work? Can you share a story of a time when you took to the streets to stand up for something you believed in? What was it that, you tell me that story if you would, and what was it that made you feel you had to engage in what you referred to as civil disobedience? So when I was, I suppose I started my journey too. I at Camp Thrill when I was 10 or 11 and 12. There's some common theme there. Um, the As I grew into my teenage years in high school, I, I was looking about what's going on in the world. There was, you know, Vietnam was in the early 70s. Uh, there was a lot of anger and frustration about how our government was handling that war, that we were, we were even fighting that war. Uh, as As I grew older, we saw nuclear weapons and nuclear power, certainly nuclear power to me became a, 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 a point of contention. Um, and so I joined a group called Safe Energy Alliance and then learned that there was protests going around. So the first time I actually came onto Long Island, there was a civil disobedience protest against Shoreham Nuclear Power Plant. And so I got on a bus, didn't tell my mother, but I just, you know, 16, 17, whatever it was, and came out here and got myself arrested for protesting the nuclear power plant. 
Uh, and that was an act of civil disobedience. But what they do is they didn't take us, they put us on a bus and they make us sit there for six hours. Uh, and I did tell you the story where they, they did let me off the bus at some point, as long as I signed an agreement that I would never go on to Lipa's or Lilco's property ever again, which I gladly signed to, to be done with them. Um, but to me, it was about making a political statement and, and questioning authority. And, and uh, the, there, was a, there was something that was mistrustful about authority in government and those in power. And how do we challenge it? And it gets back to this Thoreau concept of civil disobedience, standing up and I need to be part of this larger system, but I need to present my, uh, my, my, my opposition. And how do I do that and, and maintain my integrity and dignity? And at the same time, still, you know, I, I would go to law school, I would go to college, go to law school here in Long Island. Um, and, and so that's really where that took me. I would then join campaigns that, uh, of people that were interested. And Mike DiNocenzo, when I was in college at Hofstra, was a professor, recently passed away, but he, he was an extremely progressive and brilliant man and, and stood up for these values and principles. So I joined losing campaign after losing campaign after losing campaign because nobody wanted people who are irrationally idealistic to be responsible for governing. And so I became more seasoned and the question does is do, do, to, that I still must always ask myself, do I, does the rational somehow supersede the, the ideal? And so the practical application of enlightened political philosophy concept was something that I, I wrote about when I was young as well. And that's, you know, we study philosophy, John Locke and, and, and Rousseau, the social contract. We have to give up certain parts of our liberty, our freedom to do what we want so that we can become part of the larger community. And that's what the American system, I believe, is all about. We, we have a voice in it. That's what a democratic republic does. You have a vote, you have a, a right to participate. We have a bill of rights to make sure that those rights are protected and that we can fight them in, within the legal system, but we have to challenge them. And so that, that whole concept of apply, this system allowed us to do those things, even Thoreau, he was allowed to not pay his poll tax, go to jail for a day. Someone actually paid the tax for him a day later, he got released, but he made the statement and it became part of the message that others throughout the world took including Gandhi, and then could lead a whole movement years mm -hmm. later, taking these concepts, these ideas that, that just grow and blossom and become and impact millions of lives. I mean, it's subtle business, right? Because you have the principle um, and you're standing up for the principle. And then there's the lived reality of all these different opinions. I actually sat with this question about you. How do we reconcile love of peace, which you definitely have, and the need for civil disobedience, you know? Yeah, that's a, the, the, again, I, I refer to Gandhi, who, who I believe struggled with it because there was, even in the movement in, in South Africa at the time when, when he was fighting, you know, he was, Rousseau, by the way, was against um, the Mexican War. You know, that was we're going way back when in the eight, right. early 18, 1800s, uh, and he was against slavery. And so he was having a hard time being part of a system that adopted or allowed those things to happen. And, and so there's a lot of things that happen in my country, in my community that I disagree with. It could be they put a stop sign and I don't think there should be a stop sign there. It could be that they, they don't take out the garbage correctly or, or they, they don't treat people right or they don't protect people's rights. There's the indignities that happen. Um, and so there's this, how do we make these choices about where to draw those lines? Do I, do I fight to the to the death for, of, my, of my soul for, for the stop sign? Or is it because there's a, a, an unjust war somewhere? And yet, what if somebody attacks and kills millions of people because of their religion? Do we fight back? You know, people even today, Ukraine, you know, should, there's people who are very angry that we're engaging in a, in, a, in, a, in a violent contest. Do we not support people who are attacked by Russia? Is, is it our role? Is it, and these, are, these are questions that are not easily answered. We, we pick the right, we pick the good guy and then decide that you know, that's right. But oh, uh, everybody picks the good guy. You know, everyone on both sides of every conflict believes they're the good guy. No one goes into a fight thinking that right. we're the evil one. And right. so how do we know? And that's the great challenge that we have to face and, and try to discern. Right. Complicated stuff, no? Okay, Charlie, you need the mic. Charlie, you have chosen a spiritual life. And even though you appear to be a gentle soul now, <laughs> perhaps this wasn't always the case. 
um, being a pacifist, you were pretty distressed about the Vietnam War, same as John, right? So tell us what happened around that. Tell us about your experience as a young man standing up for your principles. Um, yes, I actually, you know, when you're younger and you see the state of the world and the injustice in the world, I spent my teenage years demonstrating against a whole load of things, but also the Vietnam War. And there was one sort of pivotal point in my life that I think pushed me into um, spirituality. And um, I went to the national capital, Canberra, and I was at a university festival. I was 17 years old. And um, we decided all the students were going to march to the American embassy and protest. <laughs> And um, one thing led to another, and the students got excited. I was arrested and put in the federal prison for the night. And anyway, we started off singing all the John Lennon songs, you know, <laughs> you know as you do. Um, but when things settled down, we spent the whole night in that jail, and these were the so-called leaders of the peace movement. I realized what an incredibly peaceless aggressive, angry group of people we were. And it dawned on me so profoundly, this doesn't connect. We're talking about peace, but we are extremely aggressive and peaceless. And that really took me into my spiritual journey that how can I tell others you should be peaceful if I don't taste it myself? And it's probably why I think one of the incredible things about Mahatma Gandhi is he really tried to live his values. And I think when you have a belief and you try to live it, it has, you know, real impact on others in that way. So I think it really started my spiritual search. And it was only a few years later that I went on that long pilgrimage to find things. So what do you do, Charlie, if you really think something is really wrong, really, really wrong, like what John talked about, you know, people are being killed because of their religion or whatever. What what is the inner state that you maintain and what kind of outer action is appropriate for a spiritual person, someone who's chosen a spiritual life? You know, in my understanding, and maybe I'm looking at the Consul General here, um, I spent, I was in South Africa when Nelson Mandela became the president. And I learned a lot from him that never once did he say apartheid was right, that all his years in jail made him really, I would say, a deep spiritual person. So he never hated the oppressors. He never had that energy. In fact, he almost worked with them. And I feel it's possible to state your truth, be your truth, but not hate the, the one who is stating something different to you. In fact, I think you have a much better negotiation ne negotiating position when you have goodwill mm -hmm. and love. And I think if you really look at the prophets through the centuries, the great saints and even more modern ones, they always stated truth, but never really hated or rejected those who didn't agree with them. Right. And to me, that's like a spiritual approach to change rather than a very overly political approach you know I'm right and you're wrong I'm that never ever works in my experience right yeah okay so Chambak you work in the business arena I did too I'm just saying some might <laughs> thank you some might think that business is an arena without principles right um but you know otherwise so what does it look like in business when principles are the underlying? And I'm thinking today that the man who founded Patagonia gave the company away yesterday, right? $3 billion a year company and gave all the proceeds to climate change. So that's one way that it looks, right? Um, but you've got some experience thinking about this, right? You and I talked a bit about John Greenleaf, et cetera. So what does it look like in business when principles are actively being applied? Uh, well, just like Charlie was explaining that um, not only do we try to see ourselves as the spirit soul, but we try to see everyone as the spirit soul who is loved by God just as much as I am. 
And so um, that means that we try to treat others with compassion, trying to um, help, it, help others succeed, um, not, you know, basically just not acting out of selfishness all the time. Right. And being the type of leader that is um, a servant leader, that is serving their people. Mm -hmm. um, and that means caring about their growth, caring about their happiness, um, helping them express themselves creatively as much as they can, right. um, have a voice and um, all those things. And it, it speaks to a lot of people in organizations because um, those are the type of types of leaders that everybody wants to follow. Right. And so when we think about what kind of leader do I want to follow, we, we see that kind of person. And so that um, through workshops and different techniques that, um, that we have, we try to inspire people to, um, to try to be more like that. Are they open? Are they receptive? Yeah. Yes, right? people are receptive. Um, there's a lot of experiential learning involved. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, different uh, games and simulations and exercises that um, are meant to just inspire you to um, see how, you know, what just happened and how you operated in that mm -hmm. fake scenario, uh, in that game. And uh, versus just, you know, when we read a book or when we um, hear someone speak, sometimes it can just be theoretical. Mm -hmm. unless that person is speaking from a very realized place that sometimes can go straight into the heart um but we we learn best from experience and and then you know so we we try to inspire people to um come to some realizations of you know wow i i should really watch that behavior that i just just had or you know i should be more mindful of this person that i that couldn't get a word in mm -hmm. in, in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all those things are meant to kind of help everyone, all of us realize that unless we try to um, make each other succeed and make each other win, we can't win right. as, a, as a collective. And we can't win as individuals. And um, It's surprising what yeah. moves people, isn't it? I'm actually remembering a conversation with uh, the president of the business roundtable in New York City. And he said they had just completed a survey of CEOs in the greater New York City area. And it was about their position on climate change. And it was specifically asking those who had taken a position. And he said the survey asked them, what was the number one reason that you shifted your position on climate change? You know what the answer was? Conversations with my daughter. Mm -hmm. Amazing, huh? You never know what's gonna, what's gonna touch someone. It can be a simulation, it can be a conversation at home that really moves people. So we don't give up on any sector, right? Business, politics, any of it. So shall we switch to God? That's much in the room already. So let's see what we can do with this. So in India, they say there are more than a thousand names for God. So I'd like to reflect on the presence of God and God's interest in the world. So John, you belong to the Jewish faith. From the perspective of your religion, what do you believe is God's interest and involvement in the world? So I would say that his involvement or God's involvement as it relates to each of us is to repair the world because the world is always in disrepair. Uh, tikkun alam is the, is the Hebrew phrase. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the name that uh, that sticks out for me for God is you know, Yahweh interpreted as I am, uh, I am who I am, or I am what I am. Uh, and so that becomes very personal. You know, we are who we are. And it always comes back to, you know, I, I take my religion as a, a people of the book or, and, and spirituality to me is, is understanding these rules, but there's a 
there's lots and lots of rules of the Jewish religion. Right. And there's, um, and, and the, the notion of, of what's important and how we discern which rules to follow. Again, it's, it's my theme even with politics. How do we know who's right and who's wrong and what, which, what's, what's rule is paramount? How do we define good and evil, uh, right and wrong? Uh, and so it has to be somehow our own identity that we've developed, I believe, the spiritual nature of me to, to, to my God is, is how can I show that I am doing right in this world? It's not whether or not I maintain some rule regarding how I eat or when I fast or when I do that. Those things are meant to allow me to maintain an identity. The rules in religion, in many respects, that are very rigorous are about identity. But the, the, the true connection to God is about who we are, what we do, how we see the world. Do we, when we challenge other people, are we angry? When we, when we look to, uh, to others, do we, if, we, if we're, we're right and they're wrong, uh, how, do we, how do we engage, how do, how do we persuade people? And then I look to the practical application of that because I, my job is to persuade lots of people to either support me and so that I can continue doing things for them or for the larger community. Uh, but also, if I'm going to make a rule or in, 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 in my world, uh, is it spiritual? I think that's personal, but is it, it's about who I am and the identity I have and how do I respect everybody so that they can come along and, and agree because I'm going to do things that are going to change their world. I'm going to put rules in uh, and requirements and, and make them stop at a red light because we put in a new light or we're going to make them pay a tax or right. make them do certain things or maybe we're going to make them go to war. Uh, and, and do other things that, that they don't want to do. So. This is very interesting, this business of following the rules versus doing what's right, isn't it? Sometimes we're asked to follow these goofy rules that we don't necessarily believe in, but we're really about what's right, right? We really want to be about what's right. So I like your distinction that whether the, the specific rule was followed, that the that the uh, that you showed up doing the right thing is God kind of a witness to that? I mean, do, is that the relationship? Is he a or it she uh, they? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It God, whatever pronoun you use. What is it a witness to what you're doing? Is it a companion? Is this a guide? That's what a good, is this? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's an answer that I I can answer other other than I I, I just thought it was interesting. And to me, there's, it's a sense of witness. We think someone's, some higher deity is watching us, so therefore right. we better do the right thing because there's consequences. Right. And that gets back down to me to civil disobedience. There's consequences we won't follow the rule. Am I willing to accept the consequence mm. for not following the rule? Am I willing to go to jail for the day? Am I willing to pay a fine? Am I willing to, to not get reelected? Am I willing, what is the consequence for me not following the system that's in place? And in religion, am I, am I it's the same thing. Am I going to risk eternal damnation because I don't do something? And what is that something? And we all make our judgments as to whether or not the things we, when we violate the rules of our spiritual guides and our, our, you know, and what, what's okay and what's not. But there is a common theme, I think, in my sense of things about, and where we bring back Thoreau back in and the whole idea of Thoreau, I believe, was, you know, it was God was nature or somehow was personal. It was very, it's a self-identification. I, suppose, I believe, and I'm not an expert on Thoreau's spirituality and transcendentalism and such, but uh, there was a personal kind of mm -hmm. responsibility that had a natural connection, and I think we right. all feel that as well. I'm curious, okay, because we've all got different rules, right? How many in this room were raised in the Jewish faith? Okay, how many in this room were raised in the Christian faith? Right? How many were raised in the Hindu faith? We're doing quite well. How many were raised as Muslims? Oh, small group. No? Huh? How many as Islam or, or Hare Krishna's is, is your faith of your childhood? Okay. Small group. Did I miss anybody? Huh? Buddhist? Raised as Buddhist? Okay. Good. All right, that's interesting, because are the rules a little different in each one? Yeah. 
Well, there's a couple kinds of rules, right? Some of the rules are sort of specific. Like if we were in school in the public schools, we didn't, we always had fish sticks on Friday because uh, the Catholics couldn't eat meat on Friday. Wasn't that the rule? Things like that at a very small particular level. And then there are bigger things, right? That if you're a Quaker, for example, or you're, you know, a serious CO in the world, the worldly sense. So I think we're talking about different levels of, of following rules. But the question, uh, one follow-up question, John, for you, how do we remain fully involved in life and also keep our spiritual beliefs and principles at the heart of our life? I think it comes down to, you know, we, ha we have many identities. You know, we, we are, you know, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a lawyer, I'm a politician, I'm a Jew, I'm from Great Neck, you know, whatever. And so I think we, we master all these identities in a way that allows us to find common threads. Uh, and so we live our life. Uh, and so for me, I suppose it's, it's as one of my identities is being Jewish, I have many rabbis in my family, but I did not go that path because I have different identities that supersede that. I wanted to be more political and, and give myself the latitude to, right. to not be bound by these restrictions, although I respect them, I try to understand them. And so I think that's, it gets back to what was said earlier about respecting what other people are thinking, even if you disagree, even if you know, someone in my temple might believe that I should be doing something on Yom Kippur, but I don't believe you know, I, can, I can get in my car and drive and they're gonna say, you have to walk. Um, and so I, I decide, have to make decisions as to what levels of importance I engage, but still maintain my identity as a Jew. Some will reject that. Israel might not accept a reformed Jew. Right. Uh, and so there's consequences to the decisions we make. So and thousands so of little to live that decisions, lots of little inside decisions that you kind of take the consequences for. And some of those are guided by our parents and our, our culture and our, our environment around us. And so we become comfortable. I'm in a place where everyone does, if everyone breaks the same rule, then it's a lot easier to break it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, we know that's true, right? Okay, Champa. Um, you are a part of the Krishna consciousness movement, right? So when you think of God or call out to God, Lord Krishna, who you invoke, how does your dharma inform your karma? In other words, how does your deepest faith inform your outer action? That's a really big question, and you can turn it into a small one if you want, and just take one little example. Can you think of a time? Let me put it that yeah, way. Uh, no, actually, I, I can kind you, of answer. You've got um, it. Okay. Thankfully, um, we, I don't have to discriminate between, you know, this is my material life, this is my work, family, and this is my spiritual life, and this is temple and Krishna and... Um, and reading the scriptures and all of that. Um, actually, bhakti yoga, what we're trying to follow, um, means you actually can do everything as an offering to God. Um, and so we try to build relationships as an offering to God, and we try to do the work as an offering. Um, and, and what this means is uh, doing things the way that God likes. And, um, and what he likes is when uh, these things are good for our spiritual progress or other people's spiritual progress. Um, and so actually, you know, it's, um, we don't have to, you know, kind of balance it. Of course, we have our material desires and material goals in life that we want to achieve. Um, and, you know, we try for that not to be, um, not to take us away from God, but to make us closer. Um, and so actually the same action can be uh, performed as a yagya, or it means offering, or as a regular action. Um, and there's a great story, if, if I can say yeah. about, um, uh, there's an example, and I, I don't remember, maybe it's uh, from a Christian book. Uh, but it's about three men that were laying bricks. 
and uh, they were asked, you know, what are you doing? And uh, you know that example. Uh, the first man said, can't you see I'm laying bricks? Um, second man said, I am, um, I'm making money, I'm providing for my family. And the third man said, I'm building a temple. And so, you know, the same action, mm -hmm. but done in three different consciousness mm -hmm. uh, with, with different intention lead to completely different results. Beautiful. Yeah, that's very beautiful. I like it. Okay. Do you all know that story? It's a good story, right? Charlie, you are a, in the BKs. You're a member of the Brahma Kumaris, right? You're a BK. Just confirming what I'm sure is pretty true. How would you explain the role of God in the world at this time? Um, once I, I'm just going to digress briefly when you called me a BK. I, one of my friends in uh, Sydney went to London and uh, <clears throat> he wanted to look up the BKs, and uh, I said, yeah, look them up and go along. And he said, I looked up, and there's just so many um, so many shops of the Burger Kings. And, <laughs> <laughs> so we sometimes have to be careful <laughs> using that. Anyway, <laughs> can you re repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> Charlie, you are a BK. <laughs> my digression was not very <laughs> elevated. All right, let's try again. Charlie, how would you explain the role of God in the world at this time? Yeah, that's a, a really fascinating question. And um, I feel that the role of God is becoming more and more important at this time. And, you know, for me, um, <clears throat> how can God really influence this world? And when I meditate... And I really feel meditation is for action. You sit and meditate, you elevate your consciousness, and that is the seed of all your behaviors and your actions. So I find for me, when I observe myself, and I think a lot of spirituality is this very gentle inner observation, I find that when I really connect with God and I see God as light, like the image here, a soul, not a belief, not a prayer, but a real sense of relationship, I change. I can feel that love and relationship softens me and my whole outlook to myself, to other people, and the state of the world. <clears throat> and I honestly feel that, um, you know, the more of us who sort of switch on the light of the relationship with God and the soul, it creates a whole different feeling. And to me, that's how God works through us. I don't personally feel God is sort of doing the nuts and bolts of change in governments and all that sort of thing. But I think one thing I've loved about the Brahma Kumaris is a little saying which says, when we change, the world changes. And honestly, in my life experience, I feel until we change in our thinking, our attitude to each other, I don't think a lot's going to change in the world around us. So to me, God's influence is through us. When we remember God, we change and we treat each other differently. And it's a tangible, tangible thing. Do you see evidence that things are changing? Yes. Do you want to give an example? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> what I sort of see at the moment is um, a tsunami of if, you, if I can use the word, I'm trying to articulate that negativity in our world that seems to be increasing, and a lot of us are really overwhelmed by that. But at the same time, I feel there's so many people, like the people on the stage, the people in this room, the people online, who want a completely different way. And I think as much as the world gets more negative, that's how much a lot of us are really thinking I really have to change. If I really want a different world, I have to live it. And I think there's a sort of a confluence of an old energy based on what I would say is a false consciousness that we're temporary bodies to a whole new energy based on the awareness of the self 
and the awareness that others are souls too. And I, yeah, there's this undercurrent mm. that I feel is growing. I don't know what you all feel out there. You feel? How many feel that what Charlie is talking about? Am there I is dreaming? some kind of an alternate un undercurrent of some sort. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And I think there is a bit of a groundswell. People really want something different. Very interesting. So I want to pull you all into the conversation. I want to open it up for you all to weigh in. Um, you see what the drift is here. How do we move towards meaning? How do we keep our kind of principles and integrity at the center of our lives? But anything you've heard that you'd like to weigh in on? I, yes, please. Um, can we take a microphone to... All right, then everyone can hear you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello. You want to say your name? Mitch. Mitch. Um, first of all, I want to say to John, thank you for being here. It's <laughs> such an honor to have a politician here. And the fact that you would come here is a tribute to you. Really, thank you. Beautiful. So being, you know, growing up Jewish. Hold uh, the mic a little closer. We've got people um, on Zoom. Growing up Jewish, I um, can relate to what you were saying. And so when you were talking about the rules, and you had mentioned something that I never really thought about, is that, you know, you follow the rules, the certain rules, you know, you, you, you observe Sabbath or whatever, or you're eating certain foods, and... That's your identity. And so you identify with that. And that becomes kind of who you are. I'm somebody that does this, and does that, and does this. And so, you know, I grew up with that. And, and one of the things was, and I think you brought, it, brought, it, brought the uh, topic up also was, what if you don't do it? Are there consequences? And so that always, you know, I always thought about that. But when I became a BK, um, it was a little different. Those, um, those traditions became an opportunity to think about God more. It was like an opportunity. It's like, now you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna pray or you're gonna, you're gonna spend more time with God. But as a BK, when I started meditating, um, they encouraged me to always think about God throughout the day. So I didn't need those traditions, you know, to do this, to do that. I'm not saying that they're wrong, right? I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying when I be, became a BK, I became more conscious of God, even if I was washing the dishes or if I was doing this, because it was like, um, just remember the teachings and to do his work and to do it, you know, the actions. It's more about actions than just, you know, doing this or doing that and trying to think about the teachings and to implement them. Makes but sense. I never got away from being Jewish. I just tried to combine right. the two, you know. That's lovely, Mitch. You know what I wonder? I bet in the original days of every religion, that's probably what was going on, don't you think? In the original, original moments, that kind of consciousness, you know, and then all these years passed and we... We probably had to have more guidance, more rules. But thanks, Mitch. That was good. What else? What else is on your mind? Yes. Yeah. Let a microphone come to you. We have people joining us on Zoom, so we want to make sure they can hear you. And if you would say your name. Hi, my name's Lori. That was Lori. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say I've been in the 12 step program for around 30 years. And it's so striking how exactly the same program is from what you're saying about you know living God living with God inviting God in with everything that we hmm. do all the time right and that our purpose is to help other people that's it to get close to God right and to help others it's Thank just you. right I was so the same it's kind of its own same. spiritual path it sounds like yeah thank you Lori what else Michelle, do you have a question in your hip pocket? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Tell them who you are. Hi, my name is Michelle. 
Um, I first I want to thank you. This is I knew it would be like out of the a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> it's it's better, but I think you've already answered my questions. But I'm going to indulge and ask you anyway. So um, and I had to write it down because I actually spent a lot of time thinking about this because it's all about me and what I'm going to learn tonight. And I'm learning a lot. <laughs> So I often find myself asking people if they're spiritual. And I, I realize that's really kind of a tough question because what does that mean, spiritual? So I, I'm going to give you my definition because, and I, and I adopted this from, it's not my own, but it, it kind of ties to what I think. It's anyone who believes that something survives death and therefore precedes birth and that it's something higher than the body Yet it's identified through the unique power. You got to be a human being to do it. Um, but the true purpose is to express that full development of the powers as being a human while you're temporarily in this body. So I started thinking about Gandhi. I really concentrated about him. I've read a number of his books and, and his autobiography, which is phenomenal. I'm going to read it again. It's a long time ago. But my question to you is, you know, and I'm gonna look at John because I was born Jewish too. And in my house too, and sometimes when I do them early in the morning, you could see the mezuzot on my door. It's my history and that's something. But I also realize, my husband, I have a sign in my house that says Gandhi's message, let my life be my message. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, I have two questions and each of you can answer, you can just choose one. Is your life your message? That's the first question. You could use that one. Or the second one, and it kind of ties in, you know, because I was in politics too. Is there a role for spirituality in politics? Can it be embraced in some nuanced way by the way we act? So those are my two questions, and you can pick one. I think Sorry. she's starting with you, John. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll... Is that my... Is that mic working? Maybe the mic help. Sandy is coming to rescue you. It's always the audio. I'm just saying that's a problem, right? Okay. So the I'll I'll go to the second one, which I think is easier. Um. So is there a role for spirituality? That that there is a role. I mean, there's two questions. Should there be a role? And is there a role? And there is a role. And, and many times, and that role is different for different people. And sometimes it's weaponized. People use spirituality as a, as a weapon to distinguish themselves from others. And they distinguish this community from that community. And then it's us versus them. And that justifies doing this to them. And that then right. leads to them doing something to us. And so Spirit and, and spirituality is a wonderful word, but it's in the name of some higher being that we that we do that. And it, it gets back to what John Brock said was, you know, when you're in business and you try to tell somebody, you know, they, if they disagree with you, and, and I think Charlie said something this too, is it is it like, are they uh, uh, are how do you convince somebody or communicate with somebody if they're disagreeing with you, and if you are angry for them? angry at them for disagreeing, then, then trouble happens. Spirituality is a very dangerous thing because we become so, our identity becomes spiritual and spirituality becomes our identity and we use words to define it. And those words, again, become weaponized. So it's the, what I find in, in politics and, and is, is that it's a really, not just a slippery slope, but there's a, it's, a, it's just a dangerous line. So how do we maintain, and it comes back to the word identity, Maintain an identity because I am somebody and these are the things that I do to make, you know, I, I grew up Jewish and maybe I've evolved to different things, uh, but I still maintain certain things because it's also a culture. It's also a history. It's also, you know, there's, 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 it, it's a, it's family. It's, it's, it's all these things. Um, and so the positive side of that coin is I believe if we had a spirituality to us that we let and res that we respected others, we try to build that the practical application of, of, of enlightened political philosophy that the practical application of spirituality and Charlie said that too how do you find a tangible meaning to spirituality is how do we make spiritual spirituality um practical and so 
how do we do it in a way that allows us in politics to simply elevate our senses of, of purpose, give us some guidance and strength, comfort in difficult times, understand that we will not understand everything. We don't have to blame people. If something happens to me, it's not always somebody else's fault. Uh, and it's not another country's fault. I don't have to attack them and destroy them because, because I need to feel better about myself. Uh, and so spirituality, when used in, a, in the higher sense, is wonderful. It should be in politics. When it's used as a weapon, it becomes very dangerous. Wow, lovely. Really lovely. That was beautiful. Thank you. Do you need those questions repeated, or do you remember them? I think I do remember them. <laughs> you know, um, it was really interesting listening to John. I think people are absolutely yearning for leaders whose life is a message, yearning for it. And I find when you're in gatherings like this, everyone quotes Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, these sort of figures who even if they had a, a partial, they were coming from a different space. Right. And it wasn't around self-gain. It was such a, it was really inspired by God. You know, really their relationship with God colored their behavior and their actions. And if you look at the people who've had the most impact on history, their life was their message all of them, Christ and Abraham and Buddha and all these sorts of people and many others. It's what people want now. They really, you know, not transactional deals, etc. They really want to see people who have a, a purity of attitude, a purity of life and a benevolence. I really feel a leadership that is genuinely benevolent. Is that what you're looking for? How many leaders like that? Yeah, and just. Right. And just, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So that's where I think if we want the world to change, I really feel we have to change. No matter how much we fight the wrongs of this world, and there's so many of them, until the, we really, I suppose, become the message, I don't think it impacts people. And all of us know, my experience is when you meet somebody who's genuinely humble, loving and kind it's really powerful isn't it it really touches you profoundly deeply even if it's just you know the person next door or an, you know it really has impact it's who we are that impacts more than what we know or our education or whatever i think it's who we are which is what i feel really it is deafening our life has to be the message for change okay jump up Vicky you want her to read them again? I don't see them. Yeah. <laughs> no one gets away <laughs> from this show. Um, well, I, 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 I think everyone's life is a message of, of some sort. But, um, you know, being a, being a regular person uh, with good qualities and bad qualities and um, going through ups and downs of life and suffering in this world, just like everyone else. Um, and having the, the privilege of spiritual knowledge in my life mm -hmm. is, is a blessing that I, I, I somehow got. Um, so, you know, being able to share um, how I'm able to, not always successfully, but uh, deal with the suffering that, that I have. Um, and share that with friends that are going through things and, you know, loved ones that are going through um, things and just sharing how we can find, you know, um, in every situation and every challenging situation, how, how can we find a way to um, not be, um, not be bitter about it, but to find a way to um, understand what can I learn from this and um, understand that no one can actually harm us. No one can actually, um, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that, um, you know, no, uh, nothing, nothing can happen to you that is not a result of your 
fast actions. And so, you know, being able to, um, being able to see what's happening with me and people that are make, maybe um, affecting me in not the best way and, you know, um, having negative feelings towards others, um, that kind of knowledge is helping me realize that this person's not the aggressor and through, through this situation, I'm able to, um, I'm able to grow and I'm able to uh, actually use the situation as a way that I can serve God. Um, and, and actually having this, having the opportunity to then share with loved ones what I've gone through um, and seeing how that resonates and helps them also get through things is something that is um, very valuable and maybe some kind of a message. <laughs> that, yeah, that's beautiful, no? Very nice. Thank you, Chambak. All right, just checking in, see if anyone else has anything you want to get. Bring the microphone here to the front. We have two right next to each other. Right here, second row, right here, and then we'll go back to Tony. So these, these two, right, the, these women right in the middle. Okay. Hi, my name is Ishi. Ishi. Uh, I have asked this question at whatever spiritual place I'm, I've been on the spiritual path since I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have never really got a, an answer that satisfied me. Okay, I'll I'll try, try these three. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, I think maybe our brains are too small to understand. I'm talking about God, right. who they say, all religions, all spiritualism says that he is the most powerful, he knows everything, and so it makes me wonder that why did he uh, create such a like a creation where there is so much of suffering and you know people I mean if you look around the world anywhere in right. the whole world there's no I mean human beings leave aside human beings animals so many beings right. so so, so why much, so much suffering the, the environment mm -hmm. is being damaged so badly and affecting all right. of us it's so, a good question it's a big I, question big yeah, question big question right. I, I have not yet all right let's try <laughs> charlie thank you <laughs> if there is this wonderful god she right next to her is her second question if there is such a god why did god create a place with so much suffering. My understanding. Am I um, yes. My understanding is that God doesn't create this world as in a sort of a can I say a Christian perspective in a way. Um, the, this world is the result of our actions. And but we can allow ourselves to have a relationship with God to change the quality of our actions to change the world. But <clears throat> I don't see that this world is, you know, created by God in a physical way. I see God's creation in a spiritual way by changing us. And that's why perhaps I'm repeating myself a bit again. I really feel. It's when we change, when we take full responsibility for me, because we live in a culture today of it's you, it's them, it's always the other. And when many of us take full responsibility of living a life with God and living according to elevated values, honestly, I think it's a simplistic answer because it's a huge, huge question, which would take a long time to unpack. But yeah, in essence, that's... Understanding, it's a very big question. Right. Okay. Yes, your name? I think it's. Hi, I'm Gitu. Gitu. 
Um, so perhaps uh, as John Kerr was uh, talking um, re regarding following the traditions uh, versus following his political path, um, I just had a couple of uh, thoughts and then I'll come to my question that's a little different. So I have three things, uh, two thoughts and a question. One, um, I have an amusing story that, you know, we follow rituals which are man-man-made. Uh, so it comes uh, to, the, to my mind, the story that there used to be a spiritual congregation and uh, there used to be a cat, you know, hanging around. And sometimes it would go meow and making noise. And so it was distracting to the people. So what they started doing was they would tie up the cat to a pole so that you know it wouldn't bother people come into the in the midst of the congregation. And so, you know, this went on every day for decades. And then those people passed away who had created this ritual and new new generations came. And they wouldn't start the congregation till the cat was found and tied to the pole because that's how it's supposed to be. That's how we've always done it. Right. We've always so tied the cat to the pole. These are man-made rituals. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, we, but if we sit in meditation and we uh, go within, you know, we we follow what the, what the answer is from within, what our conscience tells us. We can study a little bit, but follow what matters is your conscience and you, you have to answer to God. So these rituals don't really matter anything uh, most of the time because they are man-made. Another uh, something, a thought that occurred to my mind um, was since we are celebrating the 75th Independence Day of India, um, just recently I saw in the news how our Prime Minister of India, Modi, has inaugurated the statue of Subhas Chandra Bose, who now is claimed to be the first ever Prime Minister of India. And we had thought it was Jawaharlal Nehru. But that's not true. So the students in the classrooms have been taught uh, wrong history. Hmm. Again, this is man-made, and now we are making corrections for mm -hmm. the history. Okay. So this is just an eye-opener on something going on right now. And if you go to New Delhi, capital of India, the the um, what was called King's Way in Hindi was Rajpath, is now Kartavya Path, the duty. Mm -hmm. The way of duty. Yeah, the way right. of duty. Mm -hmm. And that's what is going to be called. And so we are changing our history. Again, these are man made, you know, falsely right. uh, handed down to us for the sake of ego. Right. You know, so just something I wanted to um, thank share. you for that. Did you have my a question, question also? Yes, yeah. finally. <laughs> my question is maybe to Charlie, sir, um, and maybe somebody else can answer. Um, so we talked about uh, uh, how we should live morally, spiritually out there in the world, in the business world or the mm -hmm. political. Mm -hmm. But what about the spiritual organizations? I have seen many spiritual organizations. Within them, the people, there are jealous, there is um, insecurity. And how do we handle that? I mean, it's one thing what to handle that to, but... out there in the world, but what do we do when it's going on in our family? spiritual family exactly. in the organization it's so disappointing isn't yes. it it's so discouraging very disappointing because i don't, agree don't understand it charlie <laughs> <laughs> what do we do about this thank you for that question i think <clears throat> the reality of life is that <clears throat> you know we all aspire to be a better person but we all have our inherent weaknesses. And, um, you know, I really do feel personally that the whole idea of a spiritual life is different from a religious life, which to me is more about a belief system. A spiritual life is a, a daily practice, an hourly practice, not in a stressful way, but this constant learning about the self. So I do genuinely change. But we all know it's not easy to change. And one of the main ways to change is to change my vision to other people. So the reality of life is some may be jealous, some may be selfish, some may be this. But if I react to that, then I contribute to the atmosphere. And I think what I've really learned is to 
really try to have goodwill. And I would say one of the things I've learned so much about in the Brahma Kumaris is that at the heart of change is to have goodwill for the other, rather than make a whole lot of judgments about the other one because of their behavior. It creates an atmosphere. But the more there is goodwill, I see. And that's why when I see the soul, I see with a vision of equality, not superiority or inferiority. And I have that sense of genuine love and goodwill. But we're all on a journey. We're all learning. And I think to have compassion is the most human quality of all, to have compassion for each other. So when someone does mess up and they're on a spiritual journey, I have to have compassion for them too, because we're all on this incredible learning curve. Okay. Well, there's a whole lot of methods to deal with that, hopefully. But I think ultimately, a lot of, if I would say, um, I think Champak used the word, one of the four principles is purity. What I've learned here is that we really try to develop purity within the self. The more there's purity, the less I'm influenced by others. And, you know, if we have to do, make, have meetings and resolutions and conflict resolution, whatever, because let's be honest, none of us come in whatever spiritual gathering with everything, good qualities, but we do need to do some practical things. But ultimately, I think life, we have to take responsibility for my own attitude. Someone behaves badly, and then I have a negative attitude. I think I'm doing the same as them. I'm just no better than them. I think I am. I become judgmental. But actually, when I maintain goodwill, that's the way I can bring change in a family, change in a group, change in a community. Thank you, Charlie, for that good answer. Thank you for that good question. We've run out of time. I want to thank the panelists who were brilliant. Really, really wonderful. And I'm going to ask Brother Charlie to lead us in a meditation to bring it to a close. Thank you all so much. just like to invite all of us if we can <clears throat> just for a few moments please sit and I'm just going to offer a few thoughts with the aim to experience internally. We've all been listening to a very rich and honest conversation. Now let me reflect internally. Let me reflect on the soul of India. The deep truths that have emerged from that part of the world That can help transform me and transform the world around me. Let me begin by visualizing who I am. Just hold the image of the eternal self as an infinitesimal point of life energy sitting lightly in the forehead. This is the permanent self 
that acts through the temporary self. Just feeling yourself letting go. The awareness of all the labels of your temporary self. And move into the feeling that I am a peaceful soul. I am a peaceful soul. Feel your inner world cooling down, calming down. And feel how you become an instrument to spread peace in this peaceless world. And in this state of soul consciousness, visualize the divine. The one who remains eternally pure and uninfluenced. A radiant jewel of light. an unlimited ocean of pure love. Just holding that sweet image in your mind. Feel the love flowing to you and through you into this world. that I become an instrument for God's love. And when I hold this experience in my heart, I see my family, the family of humanity. my brothers and sisters, all facing unlimited challenges in their lives. And I, as an instrument of peace and love, offer this to everyone I'm in touch with. I see beyond their labels. I meet them as a soul. This is at the heart of the soul of India. To know the soul, to love God, and be benevolent to all. Let us all live here with the feeling of making a difference by taking responsibility for who I am.
Shanti. Greetings of peace. It was a long time ago I was up here, but I'm back. And so hope it didn't feel like a long time ago. I hope it was an inspiration because that was my experience. Thank you, Brother Charlie, for the meditation. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you, Judy, for interviewing. Thanks, the singers. Thanks, the questions. And thank all of you for coming. And I am hopeful that one of the messages that you might take is to be your life as the message. And Ram, singers, participants, everybody who put it together, thank you so much for our inauguration back into the world. And a couple announcements. You're going to have a blessing and a little toli, little package as you leave, if you so choose. Um, that's our way of saying thank you. Um, and we are also going to have an in-person new Raja Yoga meditation class. It's going to begin on Monday, 7 o'clock. This is what we call the main hall. It's going to be next door through the bookshop. So if anybody's interested, you can show up a little before 7 for that. Um, and our plan for Thursdays is to uh, be on Zoom. Next Thursday, we'll not be here. Um, it will be on Zoom, and you can find some flyers out in the, um, the, the lobby that would have the links if you're not watching that. If you want to be connected, somehow somebody loves you. Somehow you found out about this program, and so keep in connection with that person or that way, um, and you'll be able to find out some of the other things that are coming up. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, we did take some photos. If you uh, have an issue with the back of your head being shown on some of our publications, let us know. Uh, most of them was for the people on the stage, but uh, if that's an issue, please, please inform us about that. And uh, again, may the soul of India travel with you, and may you share your spiritual qualities with everybody you meet, and may someday a group of wonderful people talk about how great you are. Om Shanti. Thank you very much, everyone.